Today is day 14 in a gracious space winter and I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer. Thank you so much for joining me. Day 14. It's the context, sweetheart. If you need to turn a day around, change the environment. No lectures, no shaming sessions, no tongue lashings, no careful explanations. Kids and teens respond to concrete experience, not abstract explanations and suppositions. So, if you have cranky little guys, send them to jump it out on the trampoline. If you want them to learn their prepositions, act them out with a chair. If you've got a tired hand cramped from holding a number two pencil, hand the child a marker and a whiteboard. If the kitchen table is dull and uninspiring, write on a clipboard under the table. If your teen drives, send her to the library or museum or local deli to study alone. Sounds can change everything. Play recordings of nature, rainfall, crackling fire, waves lapping on a beach. Do that during copy work time. Use jazz music when cleaning up the family room again. Add salsa to bath time or lunch or art. Create a centerpiece before math. Scavenge rocks, pine cones, wildflowers, shells, moss on bark, driftwood, and ask your kids to arrange them, perhaps in geometric shapes. Maybe they can go in a triangle, then halfway through the lessons, your kids can rearrange them into another shape, circle. Then at the completion of the lesson, a polygon. Before the read aloud face paint, pick an image or symbol from the book and put it on each child's cheek. Save writing for a teen, for midnight and candlelight. Forbid writing until they are alone in the dark with that single candle and see what happens. Wear dress up clothes, allow earbuds for music, use a typewriter if you have one. Dress up the table, light a fire, or sit outside on a blanket. Study at a coffee shop, write at a nature center, make calculations at the grocery store, skip count in Spanish, use British accents for all school-related activities for an afternoon. Instead of writing, draw. Instead of calculating with a calculator, use an abacus or measuring cups or rods. Instead of reading aloud, use audiobooks and go for a long drive. In other words, it's the context. Quote of the day, love it. Julie, you and your team are amazing. Thanks for being such a blessing to so many. Dana Roberts Brown. Sustaining thought. If your homeschool feels stale and you're in a rut, bring new energy to any subject area through refreshing the context of learning. So I talk a lot about what we call the enchanted education or the brave writer lifestyle. And if I could boil it down to a single concept, it would be caring about the circumstances around learning. It's not math, spelling, and history. It's the how. What creates the context for learning to happen? What catalyzes the aha moment, the epiphany, the now this subject is my own possession moment? Where's that coming from? So often we are led by our obligations, by our sense of duty, by the have to's and the shoulds and the oughts and the peer pressure and the feeling of being evaluated at the end of the year. That's how we move forward. When in fact, learning doesn't happen because at the end of the year, someone's going to evaluate you. Do you know that? There's no way to create the learning magic inside your child simply by telling them that at the end of the year, somebody's going to evaluate them. In fact, I would even point out that in school, just because you're getting a good grade doesn't mean you're getting an education. I don't know about you, but I was an A student and there were years at a time where I felt like a complete fraud. Have you ever felt that before? You know that you're getting A's, but you can't tell if you actually know the information. You know how to store it in that like short-term memory in order to get a good grade, to pass the test, to write the essay, 
But if someone were to ask you a week later, a month later, about the facts that you mastered, would you still own them? Would they still live inside of you? No. I remember that my ex-husband worked as a composition and literature teacher at our local university. And he used to always ask his incoming freshmen, what books did you read last year, your senior year of high school? And almost none of them could remember. There would be a student or two who would say, oh yeah, I read The Great Gatsby, or I read fill in the blank, Beloved. But the vast majority sat blankly. There was no connection. They had done reading for school, so it wasn't a part of them. It lived in this box called education. It didn't live inside of their beings, inside of their personal possession. It's why kids in school have burn parties where they literally light their work to fire at the end of the school year and don't care about preserving it because it was something they executed for the purpose of fulfilling a requirement. It didn't have anything to do with them as human beings. So when I talk about the context, you know, we all remember when Bill Clinton said about the election, it's the economy, stupid. Well, <laughs> I love homeschooling mothers too much to call anyone stupid. You're my sweethearts. So what I want to remind you is it's the context, sweetheart. You do not have to keep buying new curriculum in search of the magical formula that will get fractions into your child. Your biggest task as a home educator is to address the context for the lesson. What transcends the data? How do I enrich the environment to sweeten the deal, to entice learning, to make my children curious? How do we do that? What properties create that? One of the things that I have shared widely now is our love for combining poetry with tea time. And if you haven't been to my Instagram account, Poetry Tea Time, or our website, PoetryTeaTime.com, you are missing out on a treat and a perfect model of what I'm talking about. There is not a parent alive who doesn't believe in the value of two somewhat obscure subjects, poetry and playing violin. Have you ever met a parent who said, ah, violin, who cares? That's kind of a dumb instrument. I'd rather learn the harmonica. <laughs> Everyone who says, I play the violin, or my daughter plays the violin, or I'm going to study violin, the reaction across the board is, oh, wow, wow, that's, that's impressive. We all feel that way about violin. Poetry is the violin of language. We know reading books is a good idea. We believe in language, but poetry, is there anyone you've ever met who would say to you, poetry is irrelevant to life? I mean, when you meet that person, it's because they've been exposed to poetry and it hasn't connected. And so to downplay its value, they say it's stupid, right? That's what people do when they don't understand the value of something they've been told they're supposed to value. But that secret part of every adult knows that violin and poetry and Shakespeare, these are important. And people who have mastered them must be smart. And they are these sort of obscure yet essential pieces of, an, of a complete education. So when we talk about poetry, the natural reflex is, ah, oh, I don't want to study it, or it's over my head, or it's stupid, or a hundred things. You know, I can't do that analysis. I don't know what they meant. I don't understand the language. But secretly, we all know it's a sophisticated use of language. We all know that poetry is the violin of language. You know, it's not the harmonica. It's not the recorder. It's the sophisticated version. So how do we teach that? If everyone goes in with all this intimidation, all this fear that poetry is going to be too challenging, how do we teach it? How do we help our kids connect with the very thing we don't connect with? Well, here's what I did in my family. I lowered the bar. I said, poetry is delightful. We're going to start with humor. We're going to add brownies. We're going to drink tea in pretty teacups so that you'll want to sit at this table. And poetry automatically 
became more approachable with a brownie and a cup of tea than stiff backed chairs at a kitchen table with a mother giving information that we're supposed to retain and master. The pleasure of poetry has to precede the analysis of poems. It has to. Why would you analyze something that you don't love, that you don't find interesting, that doesn't woo you and entice you and draw you? Why would you? Just to pass a test? Okay. All right, do that. Is poetry any closer to your heart, having been forced to analyze it and then taking a test and passing? Are you any more likely to thumb through a book of poems? What is the point of education? We gotta ask it. What is the point? Is the grade ever the point? You, do you know the purpose of grades? The purpose of grades is to tell a parent who wasn't present in the room how the child is doing. That was the goal. When I was a kid, they didn't grade us in elementary school. They gave what they called progress reports. They had pluses, checks, and minuses, and they had behavioral comments that the teacher could make. Because my mother, probably like yours, wasn't sitting in the classroom. She didn't know if I was raising my hand and making meaningful contributions. She didn't know if I understood the lessons. She could see my homework that I was doing, but she didn't grade it. She didn't know the objective of the lesson. So these report cards would come home to give my mother a sense of how I was doing. Do you need that? <laughs> Do you know how your kids are doing? Are you guys sharing the same square footage like I was when I homeschooled my children? So we can get rid of this evaluating function because it's not necessary for learning. It has nothing to do with learning. Evaluation has nothing to do with learning. The only goal of evaluation is to communicate information to an interested adult who isn't present to watch the learning taking shape. So what we're talking about instead is What's the end goal then of education for everyone? Do I want my doctor to be an A student who gets good grades? Or do I want a doctor who at the end of his medical training actually cares about and knows the human body and has some insight, intuition and instinct around the task of medicine? Who's working with more than, oh, well, I got an A on that test about kidneys. I mean, really? Why do we make them go through all the other work, you know, doing uh, a residency? Why do we even bother with that if getting an A is enough? An A isn't enough. We've discovered with medicine, you have to practice it. And we call it practicing medicine. It's not an exact science. Lisa asks, how do you fit that with a charter school? Well. I was with an independent study program, eventually became a charter school in California, and uh, we didn't do grades. We did narratives, we turned in work that went in a portfolio. I personally am not a fan of grades for children who aren't in high school. I think they do more to discourage the child than they do to help the child. They can also give, alternatively, a false sense of confidence in learning where you think you've learned it because you passed a test or hit a standard, but you haven't made a relationship with the subject. And that's what we're going for. So if you're in a charter school where you're supposed to be giving out grades, at least don't show those grades to your children. And I personally would contend for not giving grades. At that point, I might just give everyone A's all the time. Because <laughs> what can they do? If grades are meaningless, then give any grade. Give A's. Just give everybody A's and just say, yeah, I feel great about how my child is doing. <laughs> no matter how they're doing, because that's the goal. Uh, yes, absolutely. So here's what I want to emphasize today is the context. So if you have the book, you can go back to day 14 and let's just look at some of these practices because I think they're really fun to look at. So I talk a lot about surprise, mystery, risk, and adventure, because these are the core faculties of an enchanted life. When you get into a routine, there's a soothing comfort that comes from the predictable, 
knowing that when I wake up in the morning, I don't have to create everything from scratch. I know we're going to read aloud. I know we're going to spend some time in these particular books. I know we're going to have lunch at this time. I know we're going to do about 10 or 12 problems of math. Like that is a comforting experience, but like all routines, it can become dull. So part of the ways that we keep ourselves engaged is to surround the activity with surprise, with a little mystery. You know, part of what makes poetry tea time so effective is decorating the table. It's having a tasty treat. And you can rotate what that is. I know families who do poetry breakfasts because they like to have a nice big breakfast and read poetry. I know families who've done poetry tea times at night when the other parent gets home from work so everyone can participate. There's someone who did a poetry tea time pancake breakfast on a Sunday. I think that would be marvelous. There is no right way to do this. What we're talking about is pairing a challenging activity like poetry, something you value, with something that brings you comfort and joy, that takes it out of this sort of sterile academic context. So what were some of my ideas? Creating a centerpiece that you only put out during math. Maybe you make it into geometric figures. Maybe you ask someone to create a centerpiece that represents the twos as times tables. What might they do? How might they represent that as a centerpiece? We get so locked into evidence being paper, something you've written on, as though that's the only evidence of learning. We used to always do skip counting with a jump rope, a frisbee, or a lacrosse stick. I would get my kids outside and we would practice reciting the times tables using something really physical that got the body engaged because there is a kinesthetic connection that occurs when your body's being used. I love, love, love teaching the fractions with a chair and I'm just gonna show you how I do that. So here's a chair, whoops, my little uh, microphone. Here's a chair, so right now I'm behind the chair. Now, I'm gonna be under the chair. Now, I'm going to be beside, next to the chair. Now, I can sit on the chair. These are ways of making things tangible, not always thinking about the abstraction. As adults, we're so into efficiency and abstraction. But how can we actually inhabit the learning and help our kids bond and connect to it in a meaningful way? That's what I want you to think about. And if you're looking at the context, like you have a child who's sick of writing, I've often said you can get a teenager to write simply by forbidding it. <laughs> Not allowed to write unless there's a candle lit and it's midnight. What would happen? I mean, you get to play with this stuff. They're sick of writing on paper? All right, give everybody a rainbow set of post-it notes, a wide variety of pens and pencils, and tell them writing can only happen on these today. And I would like you to publish your writing all over the house. And by the end of the day, I'm just gonna walk around the house and look for post-it notes as evidence of the writing you did. Do you see what I'm saying? This isn't how we think. We think, uh-oh, she hates writing. Maybe she's just sick of what you're doing. Maybe it has nothing to do with writing. Maybe she's made no connection with the power of the written word. Your job is that. Your job is to help the connection happen. I, I talk about it like a dating service. You are the Tinder of education, the Match.com, the OkCupid. Okay you're creating introductions between your children and subject matter. And some of your profile pictures for these subjects suck. They look like selfies in a bathroom. <laughs> we want there to be an engagement, an enticement, an invitation into the learning experience. How can you do a profile picture of foreign language that makes kids want to date it? Sabiha says, what if you don't have ideas? I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Now, I'm happy to give you mine, and I'm constantly sharing the ones I have, but stop and ask yourself, 
what would interest me right now? One of the things that I have told parents over and over is the first question to ask about a subject isn't how much to cover, what's the best program, does this, is this thorough enough? Those are not the right questions. The right question to ask about every subject in your curriculum, you ready? The number one question to ask is, why is this subject interesting? That is your first question every time. So imagine you are getting ready to teach grammar. Should you only think about which parts of speech you're going to cover and subject and predicate and should I or should I not diagram a sentence? Because the second you move there, it's already boring. Nobody's going to want to do it because you're going to be coming from this place of downloading information on the head of a child. And you're going to be thinking about grammar, not in terms of its intrinsic worth or value. You're going to be thinking about it in terms of what is expected. And the moment you go into what is expected, your creativity is killed. But what if you refuse to teach grammar until you yourself are interested in it? What if you say, what do you type into Google? Make grammar interesting and see what comes up. What happens if you start looking at books about grammar and you actually wait until you read a sentence that surprised you, that made you think a little differently about it? Start there. You can't build a new context for something if you don't even care about the subject yet. You hear what I'm saying? The reason you don't think you have ideas is you don't trust yourself. It's not because you don't have them. You are so used to discounting your ideas as not effective that you've stopped even noticing when they come. So let's say you've opened up this book and you're teaching basic physics to a sixth grader and there's all this information about trajectory and all of a sudden what pops into your mind is the time that you threw a water balloon. You're like, that's the picture that pops into your mind. You heard this whole thing about trajectory and in your mind this water balloon image went through your head and then you go back to reading. Here's what I want you to do in the future. That water balloon image goes through your head and you grab it and you say, oh, yeah, I'm thinking about physics and water balloons popped in my head. Done. Your next job, go buy a whole bunch of water balloons and get your kids outside and say, I was reading about physics and I suddenly thought, this is a funny, interesting way to think about trajectory. What happens when we fill it up a lot? What happens when we fill it up a little? What happens when a small child throws it? What happens when a big child throws it? Why not do all of that before you start reading the dead words on a page in a book about physics? Do you get it? Your child says, I want to study astronomy. You couldn't care less about the night sky. The thought of learning the constellations appalls you. But your child's interested. What can you do? How do you become interested? I know for me, that if I haven't got the curiosity, whether it's math, astronomy, physics, these are not my strong suits, kitchen chemistry, I can always triangle in someone who is excited about them. You can go to the local observatory. You can visit the nature center and meet somebody who's an expert in birds. You can find out who works on science in your homeschool community, what dad, what mom, you know, I didn't want to do dissections with my kids. That wasn't my jam. But I knew biology would only be interesting if there were dissections. In fact, I'll tell you this story. My freshman and high school kids, all my kids, took science with a program I don't agree with. They have a view of science that wasn't even mine. And yet, I knew this program was going to do 10 dissections that year, whereas the local school program did none. They have moved completely to computer models of dissections. They don't actually ever touch a frog or a sheep's eyeball. And so this program that was teaching, you know, cells and mitochondria and all the things kids needed to know about biology, but was coming from a perspective underneath it that I didn't even agree with, I still put my kids in that program because I knew they would learn more about biology if they did 10 dissections than if they supposedly, quote unquote, got the right base thinking and never did a dissection, 
We could have all the worldview conversations we wanted at home. What I wanted them to experience was what is biology close up and personal. Out of five kids, four of my kids did that class and the fifth one did a traditional biology class. Guess who remembers more about biology? The kids who did the dissections, of course, far more interesting. Do you understand? So some of what I'm trying to say here is we focus so much on aligning worldviews, on having the right product, on having an author we agree with, on having a relationship to the subject that is all built from outcomes and college credit, you know, high school credits accumulated for college admissions. When what we should be interested in is starting a great conversation about that subject in a context that's conducive to it. So poetry goes great with tea. Dissections go great with biology. And so what if they don't totally agree with your views? Can't that be a conversation? Isn't it also valuable to be put into a situation where the person who's teaching isn't identical with your views? Don't you learn something about that as well? So as we are focusing then on learning, work on the context. Give yourself the permission to think about what makes me interested in this subject. What might make my child interested, which will be different than you, because you're, you know, this adult and they're these children. You know, if we're going to study nature and get all abstract trying to identify different trees, how can I help a child connect to the name of a tree? Why would that matter to my child? You know, can we do some bark rubbings? Can we make up silly rhymes or tongue twisters around those tree names? Can we play like my mom liked to do with my kids, a tag game that involves running from tree to tree that she made up? You gotta think more like a child. And here's what's wonderful. Because you're at home, because you're not at school, you get to. You get to. You can take time. If the subject isn't interesting to you yet, then don't teach it. <laughs> don't ruin the subject by teaching it when you don't care about it. I mean, heck, if you don't like it, why should your child? You think they don't pick up that energy? You think they don't notice when you don't like the subject? You know, my favorite story is where I didn't know how to teach fractions and I went and hid myself in the garage trying to learn how to teach fractions on the fly while four, you know, four or five children were screwing around in the living room. I come back in, I sit Noah down, I say, here's how you do fractions. He does the whole page and he turns to me and says, so mom, I guess I only need to know fractions in fourth grade and if I'm ever just going to teach them again to a fourth grader? I uh, yeah, no. <laughs> I did not spend any time thinking about the use of fractions in my own life. I was a quilter and I knew how to bake. And it never occurred to me to start by looking at shapes and fractional pieces that were already in my life before I dove into finding common denominators. And you know what's funny? Here's what's incredible. It wasn't until I started teaching my own children that I even understood that math had any role in my life whatsoever. I had been so bad at math for so much of my life that I actually believed I was living without it. I used to say those ridiculous comments like, algebra isn't a part of my life, geometry isn't a part of my life, I never needed it. And yet there I was, running a business, I was quilting, I was baking, I was relying on math in a few key areas of my life. And I didn't even realize I was doing it. I also didn't realize that I was dividing and doubling and tripling and one and a half times in recipes. Because I knew how to do that in cooking. I didn't realize that that was math. Are you hearing me right now? I was a straight A kind of student. I was really good at school. And yet I never even made the connection that math was active in my life because I assumed I was terrible at it. How crazy is that? So, your job, 
when you are thinking about education is to consider the context. You ask yourself the primary question, why is this subject interesting? That's what you ask, right? And once you drill down and find some little interesting hook, now you ask yourself, how do I get this interesting aspect of the subject across to my child? Not, how do I get this information into my child without him crying and whining and being mad at me? Right? Because we're so focused on the discipline side all the time, like, she needs to cooperate. I remember reading this whole thread one time on a homeschool discussion board, a very well-known one. And a mom was complaining, my child doesn't like to write. I don't know how to get this child to write. I was getting ready to talk about free writing and gel pens and black paper and post-it notes on somebody's door and, you know, all these things that I've used to help engage children in writing. And all of a sudden, this flood of posts I start reading. You're the mother. <laughs> You're the mother. She's the child. She needs to do what you say. If you let her get away with not writing now, she'll be bucking you for the rest of her life. And yes, that's right. Writing isn't fun, but it's important. And she just needs to know, you know, and then someone's like, well, my daughter's 13. I don't know. Well, then I would strip her bed of her sheets and tell her she can have them back when she starts writing. Like literally this very Dr. Laura kind of advice, like just diving in on this poor family. And all I could think was, but writing's awesome. Apparently, even you, the parents, don't know that. Because you think writing is hard and horrible and something that we're doing to our children. I don't want that. Do you want that? Is that the homeschool you envisioned? This strict disciplinarian, this calling your child lazy or willful as the goal, and your job is to beat it out of them, either verbally or with wooden spoons? I mean, really, is that why you signed up for homeschool? Because it sure wasn't for me. I wanted an adventure in learning. I wanted my kids to actually love learning, which, you know, sometimes is more like code for, I want them to love the assignments I give them. You know, maybe see it that way. What if your child doesn't want to do the assignment? How do you get them to love learning? Not by requiring them to do the assignment. They're telling you right now, the thing you're giving me, I don't love. <laughs> they're telling you. And then we say, well, I want my child to love learning. Well, they're telling you, I don't love this. So what are you going to do about it? How are we going to make that connection happen? How are we going to bring about love in the learning? Maybe start with you. Do you love this subject? Is phonics a turn on? <laughs> Are you like, yes, my life lights up when I think about phonics? Every subject in the world is infinitely interesting. There are PhD dissertations on the most minute details of every field of study. Someone has found a way to be curious about the colon in, you know, deep degrees. <laughs> I mean the human colon. I don't even mean the colon in grammar, but yes, that too. So it's possible to be fascinated by anything. And your primary job as a home educator is to become fascinated. Because if we can catalyze a love of learning in you, my goodness, it will happen with your children. You will start to recognize what that feels like. What does it feel like to be absolutely fascinated with, curious about grammar or early American history or literature or phonics? digraphs and blends. Why are those interesting? Make sense? Yes, from the Beatles to botany, it's all fascinating. Absolutely. You know, and you all know my other one too, right? You can teach everything through anything. You can pick one painter in history and you can get history, literature, art, science, politics, economics, language, literally everything because at any entry point, all those things are present. You literally could pick rock and roll. Who's watched School of Rock? Okay, that is such a masterful example of how these kids are learning everything through anything. You start with rock and roll and you start doing the history of rock and roll. What are you learning? What's the meta thing you're learning? How to study history, how to understand influences, how to understand the coordination of those influences and how they shape streams of thought 
musical ideas, how to participate in that development. I mean, really, that's an amazing movie for the whole concept we're talking about here. Make sense? All right, let's see where we are. That's a good length. I think we'll wrap up today. So today is day 14. It's the Context Sweetheart. You can buy this book, A Gracious Face, or download it as a digital copy. Uh, those are both available at the link that I posted with this conversation. And if you love what we do here, we do this in much more depth in my community, the Homeschool Alliance. Click on coachjuliebogart.com to sign up. We do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We just keep doing more of these. And what's awesome is you get to talk back to me and we make a really great opportunity for you to apply these insights to the daily lived experience of your homeschool. That's my goal. You know, people want to know the how-tos, but what I'm hoping for is that you are creating your own how-tos. I want to give you sort of the vision, the platform, the theory, the sense of opportunity in front of you, and then we want to all collaborate in the curation of your own homeschool experience. So great getting to see you today. Thank you for sharing this, bro this broadcast, and I will see you again next Monday at 11.30 here on Facebook Live. Thanks, everybody. Live honestly, write bravely. I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer.